Okay, I think uh, we'll get going. <coughs> um, I want to introduce uh, our today's topic. It's our 29th annual Humanization of Care Awareness Program rounds. Uh, these rounds uh, have garnered a lot of attention in our hospital and for good reason. Uh, we have one of uh, a lot of emphasis on humanization of care over the years uh, at our institution. So uh, before we talk about uh, uh, or introduce today's um, topic, I'm going to introduce uh, Vivian Myron, who actually is a well-known individual in our institution. She's been with us for uh, a number of years. She's a clinical coordinator of oncology social workers, which is a big job, and the social worker in the palliative care unit on Four Main uh, at our institution. She has worked at the Jewish General Hospital in many areas of oncology and palliative care primarily, as well in geriatrics, medicine, and surgery. At present, she is the co-chair of the Canadian Accreditation of Standards in Palliative Care, and she's involved in the Humanization of Care Committee. I'm going to ask Miriam to introduce our uh, Humanization Care Committee. Miriam? Hi, everybody. Okay, so welcome to the Humanization of Care Medical Grand Rounds. Um, and I just want to tell you a little bit about Humanization of Care. We are, it's a committee that's co-chaired by um, Rosalie Johnson and Vivian Konigsberg. It's been around for around 30 years. And it is run by a group of very committed and devoted professionals and volunteer lay people. And the mission is really to enhance the patient experience and to focus on the patient as the center of care. Um, we want to really, we try to improve the quality of life for our patients and their families. And this has been accomplished through many, many projects. And really, it's, there's way too many to start listing, but I'll give a couple of examples. And uh, we have a campaign of respect. Um, I don't know if any of you were here for our last medical um, grand rounds where uh, Francine Dupuis had spoken about the respect campaign. And we have done that hand in hand with the resources, uh, human resources from the hospital. Anyways, we did such a great job that the CUS has now taken it over and they are um, now developing this program um, campaign of respect. And right now, we have just launched a new campaign, which is around the mental health issues of our patients and to sensitize the staff and personnel of our hospital around mental health. Uh, also, please remember, Wednesday is uh, Bell's Let's Talk Day. And um, thank you very much and enjoy. Okay, thank you. So let me introduce uh, today's speaker. So Ella Amir has been uh, executive director of Amy Quebec since 1990. Under her leadership, the organization has become one of the principal resources in Quebec for families struggling to cope with mental illness. In addition to providing direct support for, to families, Amy Quebec is working extensively with uh, healthcare providers on various partnerships and collaborations. Ella was the chair of the Family Caregiver, Caregivers Advisory Committee for the Mental Health Commission of Canada since its inception from 2007 till 2012 and is now a member of the Commission's Advisory Council. Ella had led the development of the guidelines for caregiver support, a blueprint for the comprehensive system of care to support family caregivers across the country. Ella holds a PhD in psychology and applied human sciences from Concordia and an MBA from McGill University. And today she's going to be tackling a, a hot topic and the name of the, and the talk is Tackling the Roots of Mental Health Stigma and Discrimination in the Healthcare System, a very relevant discussion. So Ella. Thank you. I have to say that I feel a great responsibility. I didn't realize that this is once a year grand round. 
Uh, so I really have a responsibility to deliver. If you have a weekly grand round, one is not so good, you'll come to another one next week, but this is just once a year. So um, maybe just to say a word about um, Ami Quebec, for those of you who are not familiar with Ami Quebec, uh, I can probably talk better about caregivers because this is really what Ami Quebec has been doing for the past 40 years. We are working with caregivers, families, friends, and so on. Um, uh, who um, are uh, helping uh, people or loved ones with mental illness, mental health problems. Uh, and as you can understand, we have been working uh, for 40 years and I don't quite see that it's going to end anytime soon. Um, but talking about stigma is also a very relevant issue for family caregivers. Today we are going to talk uh, mainly about uh, stigma and discrimination and how it affects people with mental illness and mental health issues in the healthcare system. So uh, just um, as a way of uh, a little bit of history, in 2006, uh, Standing Senate Committee on Social Affairs, Science and Technology uh, was entrusted with the role of reviewing the services in mental health, mental illness and addiction throughout the country. It was the first time that uh, a initiative like that had taken place. Uh, and at the time, uh, Canada was the only G8 country without mental health strategy. Uh, the commission report, the, the, the uh, standing committee report that was uh, titled Out of the Shadow at Last, Transforming Mental Health, Mental Illness and Addiction Services in Canada, uh, recommended a number uh, of things among them to create a mental health commission for Canada. And this happened in 2007 with the blessing of the federal government and the blessing of all uh, provinces and territories. The role of the uh, commission was to be a catalyst uh, for improving mental health systems and changing attitudes and behaviors. And the recommendations were supposed to be given to government, to service providers, and to community leaders. So they were not, the commission has not been created as a service provider's outfit, but uh, rather as a intermediary, if you will, that should work with different uh, stakeholders in the community. In 2001, I think that it's in interesting to note, the uh, World Health Organization uh, declared stigma as the single most important barrier to overcome. Uh, when we are talking about stigma, we really do talk about stigma and discrimination. Stigma is really the attitudes and perceptions people hold towards stigmatized uh, groups. But discrimination is really the outcome of stigma. And this is really the more serious, um, uh, the most, more serious barrier uh, to help seeking behavior. So we will talk about that. Additionally, I want to uh, mention that the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities uh, does require the um, uh, countries to foster respect, to combat stigma and discrimination, and to uh, improve the care that they provide uh, for people with different disabilities. So in this uh, context, the Mental Health Commission of Canada that was created, as I said, in 2007, um, identified a number of priorities. One among them, a high priority, was given to uh, stigma and discrimination. Uh, the commission had the, uh, uh, recognized that stigma is primarily a problem of behaviors that result in the unfair and inequitable treatment of people with mental illness and their family members. So uh, the commission initiated a, um, a, a program that was called Opening Minds, and the goal was to affect change uh, that will result in tangible improvements in the day-to-day -day lives of those living with uh, mental illness. And I think that it's interesting to note that uh, there have been some studies uh, across the world, I should say, especially the Western world, uh, about stigma with uh, very limited results. Um, there were some, uh, there are some studies that indicated that stigma has subsided to some extent, but not discrimination. 
So this obviously was not good enough, and uh, the Commission decided that they really have to do a better job in order to affect not only negative attitudes, but also the behaviors that uh, uh, result from, from these attitudes. Uh, they decided at first to focus on two groups. One was youth, 12 to 18 years old. The other one was uh, healthcare providers. Uh, the reason why youth were uh, singled out uh, is that uh, many mental health problems and mental illnesses see the first symptoms before the age of 25, very often uh, in teenage years. And uh, a survey that was done discovered or basically indicated that 60% of youth have indicated that they have been stigmatized by uh, health professionals. So it was really very important, or in general, also by the public. So it was really important to address this age group. Healthcare providers were singled out also because uh, it was found out, and I will try to, uh, to, to uh, demonstrate with different uh, studies that were done in this domain, uh, there is the, the stigma and discrimination are rampant uh, in the healthcare uh, profession. Uh, I should say that, again, I'm talking about mental health and mental illness in, uh, specifically, but I think that when we talk about stigmatizing attitudes and discrimination, discriminatory behaviors, we are talking about other groups. We are talking about elderly, we are talking about Muslims that just yesterday marked this first anniversary of the, um, uh, of the attack in the mosque in, in Quebec uh, City. So I think that even though I'm talking really specifically about mental health and mental illness, I think that many of the things that I will be uh, talking about today can be generalized to other domains. Stigma is stigma and discrimination is discrimination. <clears throat> so what is stigma? In 1963, Goffman uh, suggested that stigma is a complex social process of labeling, othering, devaluation, and discrimination involving an interconnection of cognitive, emotional, and behavioral components. Well, this is a mouthful, but I think that basically what we are talking about is negative attitudes and perceptions that result in discriminatory behaviors. Um, stigma is prevalent in various domains, as I said, and it is mostly associated with various disabilities and conditions that put the stigmatized person at the margins or outside of mainstream. And uh, usually stigma is being uh, held by powerful groups. So as a powerful group, uh, the healthcare sector is a powerful social group that uh, stigmatized and uh, the st where stigmatization is uh, occurring on different levels. There are three levels of stigma. We are talking about, and again, the three levels of stigma are general uh, level of stigmas el everywhere, but it can be translated uh, easily uh, to the healthcare uh, profession. One is the intrapersonal stigma, which is self-stigma. Uh, and this is where people who are stigmatized internalize the stigma that is being directed towards them by the public or by you know, whoever it may be. Uh, they feel blameworthy, they feel ashamed, and they try to avoid the stigmatizing um, situations. Uh, this is why very often people with mental illness uh, uh, fail to uh, seek help they try to avoid the stigmatizing you know, environment and uh, as a result uh, uh, don't seek help. But it can also be um, a, a, an issue with providers in the healthcare system uh, who are reluctant to disclose their own mental illness. I, you know, in the previous um, uh, uh, slide, I uh, say that you know there were two groups that the Mental Health Commission uh, focused on. One was youth, and another one was healthcare providers. But with time, they also added the media in the workplace. So when we are talking about uh, healthcare providers who are reluctant to disclose their situation, you can really uh, view this form as double. Both are the healthcare providers who are stigmatizing against people with mental illness, mental health, and other conditions. But these are also a workplace that where people who are working in this environment are reluctant to disclose their situation and as a result also uh, reluctant to uh, seek help. The other level of um, 
uh, stigma is interpersonal, and this is the relationship between the public and uh, the individuals who are being stigmatized. And in this uh, domain, it would be bef between healthcare providers and, uh, and the stigmatized uh, people. And again, uh, the interaction produces uh, discriminatory behaviors and negative attitudes. The third level of uh, stigma is structural stigma, and this is as serious as the interpersonal stigma because it is really uh, translated into policies and laws and standards of care that are uh, said to be uh, inequi inequitable with other, uh, with other standards of care. If we compare sometimes uh, physical health and uh, mental health, uh, it is uh, suggested that people with mental illness and mental health problems are subjected to discriminatory uh, policies and standard of care. Uh, and this is exactly what we are trying to talk about uh, today. Um, stigma in the healthcare, just to be, to give you some examples, I'm going throughout my talk, um, to give you some example of different studies, different uh, surveys that have been done. I think that this is uh, probably much more, um, it reinforces the notion that uh, stigma and discrimination are a serious uh, issue in, in our culture. So research that was done with patients um, suggests that uh, patients do feel devalued dismissed, dehumanized by health professionals, and uh, it is affecting their relationship with healthcare providers in a negative way. It creates barriers to recovery. And as you see here, uh, a person with mental health uh, problems say, after surgery, my surgeon told me, had I known you were crazy, I wouldn't have operated on you. This is from the Ontario Health, um, uh, Ontario Health uh, commission, um, a human health com uh, commission. Uh, when research was done with healthcare professionals, um, it's really very interesting to note that uh, very often they didn't even recognize and didn't realize that they are actually holding negative attitudes and discriminatory behaviors. Um, but it was found out that they do often hold uh, hostile, um, hostile uh, attitudes and uh, blaming attitudes towards uh, their clients with mental health problems. Uh, they also found to have low belief in recovery. And recovery, it's a bit of a tricky uh, terminology. Um, well, you know, those of you who are working in the public sector, especially in the medical profession, um, of usually working with a medical model. Medical model is really is an illness model, and in the uh, context of mental illness, it really uh, focuses on a reduction of symptoms and on management of the illness. In more recent years, there is a new uh, paradigm that is called the recovery vision that believes that uh, whether while there is mental illness in, in uh, many cases, it is not synonymous with mental health uh, in the same people. And the, 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 you know, what uh, was found out that among healthcare professionals, there is really low belief in recovery. I would have preferred that we will call it recovering because with the absence of cure for mental illness today, I think that it's probably uh, more appropriate to talk about recovering, suggesting that recovering is really a lifelong, very often a lifelong journey of the person with mental illness to regain his mental health and to uh, lead a satisfactory life. Um, another thing that was discovered with uh, healthcare professionals is that they don't have the skills to deal with people with mental illnesses and don't have the confidence very often to do that. Um, and as I said, uh, they are not aware very often that uh, they actually have prejudicial uh, attitudes uh, and that they actually uh, treat people with mental illness um, uh, with discriminatory behaviors. Uh, the structural stigma, as I said earlier, and I'll probably say it again, uh, ends or results in longer wait time for people with uh, mental illness, uh, lower funding and resources, and fragmented care. So this is obviously a uh, reason for concern, and this is exactly, again, why we are talking about it today. 
Just to give you an example uh, of what I was just talking about, um, I, I think that some of you may still hold the notion that mental illness and mental health is exactly the same, and if someone has mental illness, he cannot have mental health. Uh, but what the recovery vision and what we are uh, uh, believing and suggesting is that someone can have mental illness, but he can also have very good mental health. If someone has schizophrenia or depression, and he can still get up in the morning and feel that he has, uh, that he has relationship with uh, family and friends, that he has hope uh, for, his, uh, you know, for his life, that he has a purpose and meaning to his life, and he feels that he has identity beyond his mental illness and feel empowered to have control over his life, we suggest that this person can have pretty good mental health. At the same time, someone can have no mental illness to speak of, and also no mental not, not mental illness to speak of, but also not mental health to speak of. You know, someone, you may know someone who is, um, has no reason to get up in the morning, is very lethargic, and you know, bored and uninterested, and so on and so forth. I know many people with mental illness who have managed uh, to regain their sense of well-being and mental health. And I think that this is exactly what we are talking about. And I don't think that this notion and this vision is yet uh, integrated into the psyche of uh, the medical uh, profession. The impact of um, a stigma on health. So again, as we said, uh, stigma creates barriers to help seeking effective treatment and recovery from mental illness and leads to poorer physical care. And just as an example, um, we say that uh, mental illness is one of the biggest factors in lower health uh, outcomes. And again, just to uh, give an example of a study, uh, there is a huge mortality gap between people with mental illness and the counterparts who don't have mental illness. And it is said that, that, that the gap is 20 years for men and 15 years for women. To some extent, it is, uh, well, you know, it's probably a, uh, there's a combination of more than one factor. One of them is that people with mental illness very often have myriad of other physical problems. Some of the reason that their physical problems may not be addressed properly is the stigma, uh, and so on and so forth. So, you know, as we say, stigma are considered as a major contribution, contributor to this uh, disparity. I just want to you know, show you a, a video clip that I think could be of interest. I, I walked into an, an emergency department when I was having a bad, I had a bad knee. And when I, I get to the emergency department, my mental illness pops up on the screen. And I wasn't treated for, for, my, for my knee, I was treated for my mental illness. When I first started working at a, as a crisis nurse, an emergency nurse came up to me with a big smile on her face and said, there's a loser waiting for you in the waiting room. And I looked at her and I said, I beg your pardon? And she looked at my face and she said, oh, there's a patient waiting for you uh, in the waiting room. And I said, thank you. Six months later, this person got a promotion. So I think this is a huge problem. I think we as healthcare providers let it happen. Um, it's almost cool to be part of the in-group in a way. Oftentimes people who are returning to the ER will be recognized by the intake workers, by the registered nurses, by the physicians. Um, and sometimes it, it's, it's frustrating. Nurses, physicians try to do a really thorough job as, as much as they can and to see someone come back um, I think sometimes may feel like it's, it's, uh, they failed somehow. And so, um, and so you might see the rolling of the eyes by the nurse, uh, who's doing the triage. Um, you might hear the nurse say, here comes Mr. X again. Uh, what does he want this time? Uh, you'll hear it in the tone of the voice and I'm sure that individual feels it. Too often uh, you may find that some staff will put a behavioral problem towards the bottom of the queue because um, 
again, because they're not comfortable dealing with it, they're hoping it'll go away or maybe somebody else will deal with it. So they may face longer than usual waits uh, for care. On a professional level, I see it many times um, as a practicing psychiatrist. Many of my patients talk about it. I saw a lot of difference between having cancer and having a mental illness. When I had my breast surgery and chemotherapy, radiotherapy, I received so many flowers and letters. But when uh, depression came afterwards, the phone, the flowers um, did not come. I do not blame no one, but I think this is, um, this is a sign that people don't feel comfortable about talking about it. So, um, you know, I think that this probably resonates with many of you. This is in their own voice, in their own uh, words, people with mental illness and healthcare professionals. Um, so, you know, let's talk a little bit about some of the consequences of, um, uh, of the stigma. So, uh, one of the uh, consequences is delay in help seeking. As I said earlier, uh, this is not only because people are not seeking help, but also because they are not being provided with the proper uh, help, maybe with the proper help. So, for example, there is one year for psychosis, and you can, we can assume that psychosis is probably um, a condition that uh, cannot be delayed forever before some help can be given. But uh, take a look at anxiety and depression. There is more than eight years uh, before people are actually seeking or receiving help. And it is even longer for vulnerable, other vulnerable uh, uh, populations. Uh, early termination of treatment. Patients dropping out, usually because they are dissatisfied with services. Uh, rejection by health providers, being discharged or turned away. And again, I see that it's probably associated with the, uh, with the testimony that we just uh, heard a minute ago. Uh, there are negative consequences that include increased risk of suicide, and we will see some more uh, outcomes. Uh, inadequate mental health care. There is a large discrepancy between delivered care and effective evidence-based care. And uh, I, I think that, again, uh, when we are talking about the medical model and we are talking about a new paradigm, which is a recovery model, I think that this is just one example. I think that there are many other examples that uh, suggest uh, the same. Poor relationship between health providers and patient. Uh, lack of provider skill, confidence, as well as low provider's motivation. We talked about uh, a sense of uh, many healthcare professionals who don't feel comfortable dealing with mental illness, mental health, uh, they very often are not interested. I think that just a few years back, there was an attempt on the part of uh, uh, the government to entrust some of the care uh, in people with mental health in uh, the hands of GPs and other professionals. Uh, and the, the uptake was not terrific. I understand that uh, there is um, not just lack of motivation, but really lack of comfort in dealing with issues that uh, people have not been trained to uh, deal with. But I think that this is, again, just one example of the challenge that we are facing. Um, patient safety is compromised, and we will uh, see it uh, a little uh, later. Again, to give you just a few examples, uh, a Danish study from 1996 uh, examined reasons for dropping out of care despite on on ongoing need and found out that 27% dropped out of care in the first year. This is a huge proportion. These are people who do require help and, you know, more than one in four would drop out uh, within the first year. The main reason was, that was cited, we said earlier, is dissatisfaction with care. 44%, almost half of the people who did drop out uh, were not satisfied with the care that they received. Another uh, study that was uh, done on healthcare delivery found out that only 27% properly used evidence-based, again, we just mentioned it, um, uh, evidence-based clinical guidelines. This is also pretty uh, sad uh, testimony uh, to the to, to the you know state of uh, uh, of care, lack of skills, low provider motivation indicated as factors as well, and there was another large study of uh, of mental health care consumers 
uh, people with lived experience that suggested that only 48% per of patients receiving specialized mental uh, health services reported their care as adequate. And when we are talking about specialized care, we're talking about psychiatry, psychology, social workers, etc. but people with mental health training. So less than half of the people were satisfied with the care that they received. When it comes to primary care, it was much worse. Only 12% uh, reported that they received adequate care in primary care. So this is really, you know, there is much to um, uh, be desired. And some Canadian findings. Uh, service providers may use common language that is discriminatory, judgmental, and derogatory, which can impact on a potential service user's willingness to access a service. This is again from the Ontario Human Rights Commission uh, from 2012. And additionally, people with mental health disabilities and addictions may experience unprofessional behavior or inequitable treatment from service providers that could amount to an unwelcoming, harassing, or poisoned service environment. Stigma in patient safety. Again, you know, the consequences are really uh, uh, quite serious. And recent academic study identified stigma as a barrier to patient safety through such factors as staff attitudes, institutional culture, and accepted marginalization of mental health patients. Um, so for example, the use of seclusion and restraints in inpatient facilities estimated to cause 150 deaths a year. This is American study, but I think that you know we can certainly um, apply it to here uh, and recognize that this is a serious issue. Uh, when we are talking about restraints and seclusion, we are not talking about uh, physical uh, restraints, but also chemical restraints. We are talking about over medication, uh, and which has a very similar uh, effect. Uh, in recent years, there has been a uh, ongoing discussion about the. Uh, aim of uh, reducing the use of uh, seclusion and restraints, but it's an, it's an ongoing uh, discussion and uh, there is yet, as we understand, uh, overuse of these uh, methods. Um, again, a quotation uh, from uh, Ontario Human Rights Commission. Some people told us about people being restrained for hours or days at a time. I certainly hope that it doesn't happen here. Some indicated that they were not checked on by staff. In one case, a person described how her son was not let out to use the washroom after being physically restrained for eight hours. This is, uh, you know, I don't really think that I have to say anything beyond that. This is really pretty serious business. Um, we also talk about uh, physical care. Uh, which is uh, seriously impacted by, uh, uh, by stigma. And again, some examples. Uh, it suggests, studies suggest that up to 80% of people who do suffer from mental illness uh, suffer from other uh, concurrent physical illnesses. And higher than average rates of diabetes, uh, respiratory diseases, heart disease, and cancer. And as we will see in a minute, uh, very often, or at least uh, too often, uh, their physical conditions are not being treated uh, as it sh they should have, uh, and stigma, again, is one of the barriers. Yet people with mental illness receive poor quality physical care. Diagnostic and treatment overshadowing, and this is, the, again, the process by which um, uh, physical symptoms are misattributed to mental illness. And again, you know, the uh, testimony of the uh, patient before who say that, um, the patient who say that, the, you know, the doctor said, if I knew that you are crazy, I wouldn't have, you know, uh, treating, treating you. So um, this overshadowing uh, leads to uh, biases and uh, delays in diagnosis and treatment options and is, as we said, a consequence of uh, stigma. So uh, a little bit more uh, of examples of er overshadowing. And I think that this is really telling. Again, this is based on research that was done. So this is really not just a whim of someone who feels that he didn't get uh, sufficient treatment. Uh, so Corrigan, who has been doing research on stigma for many years, uh, used a hypothetical patient uh, with schizophrenia and uh, who was uh, seeking help for lower back pain due to arthritis. 
and providers with greater level of stigmatizing attitudes were more likely to believe that patients would not uh, adhere to treatment. They were less likely to provide a referral to a specialist, and they were less likely to provide a prescription refill. And this is, again, someone who didn't have schizophrenia but uh, uh, posed as, uh, as someone with mental illness. Another study of 96 uh, Canadian uh, ER uh, emergency wards uh, found a significantly lower priority triage scores for patients with a charted history of depression. Additionally, uh, significantly higher odds of missing benchmark times for key quality indicators. Uh, and again, another uh, research with a huge, a big, big a cohort of patients found that 90%, 19%, uh, found 19% increase in mortality at one year compared to those without history of a mental illness. And excess mortality attributed largely to deficit in quality care they uh, received. So um, what do we do? Uh, I think that it's very interesting to talk about stigma discrimination, but I think that it's really important to think what can be done in order to reduce the negative of effects of uh, both uh, stigma and uh, discrimination. So I would like to uh, show you another clip of uh, a video. I don't think that healthcare workers need to provide something grandiose at all. I think simply looking you in the eye and saying, you're having a really rough night, or this is a bad day, or I'm sorry you're feeling like this right now. I think really um, listening is the biggest thing because when you go and ask for help, it takes every part of you. A lot of asking in healthcare is, is kind of rote asking. It's asking the, the prerequisite number of questions and certain questions that will give them certain clues vis-a-vis -vis diagnosis or stability or so on. I think the healthcare system needs to listen. This is uh, pretty straightforward. So we are talking about lack of confidence and lack of skills. I think that this suggests that, uh, you know, you're talking about humanizing the healthcare system. Listening is, you know, uh, probably the very first, um, uh, the, fir the very first skill uh, that uh, we should exercise. Uh, listening, uh, respect, uh, consideration. Uh, this is again, I don't think that this is really unique to people with mental illness, but as you say, you see, it goes a very uh, long way. Uh, tackling the roots of stigma, I think that we talked about it already. Uh, maybe we can go forward. And um, maybe just to suggest again that, uh, the as I said earlier, the Mental Health Commission of Canada um, uh, singled out stigma as one of the highest priority uh, uh, for them. Uh, the commission's uh, life span, uh, to begin with, was of 10 years. It was uh, between 2007 and 2017. Uh, the uh, mandate was extended for another two years, and we hope that it will be extended for the balance of uh, 10 years. Uh, so, you know, as I, I mentioned earlier, at the beginning, uh, the commission has done pretty extensive work with the media. But, uh, and again, with the understanding that uh, me the media is responsible to a large extent to the information that we have uh, and to th the stigmatizing attitudes. But they did find that this was not really terribly effective, and while stigma subsided somewhat, uh, discrimination had not. Uh, what they decided instead is to identify different uh, anti-stigma programs throughout the country, evaluate them, create toolkits, and implement or encourage the implementation of these kind of programs throughout the country. And I'll give you after uh, a little later a couple of uh, examples of programs that have been found to be very uh, effective. But there are really some key messages that the uh, Commission has identified through their work uh, on this anti-stigma campaign. The first one, uh, the importance of including people with lived experience in anything related to, uh, uh, to, to their care, if you will, uh, in designing services, in developing solutions, and in execu executing programs 
uh, to combat stigma. Uh, the notion of nothing about us without us, uh, or the, you know, the slogan was created by the commission, and I have to say that they put their action where the mouth is. Uh, in all the advisory committees that uh, existed in the first five years of the commission, there was a, a healthy representation of people with lived experience. Today, there are at least two forms of people with mental illness that provide um, advice to the commission. So I think that the commission, uh, maybe not in the very first early days, but today are really uh, true to the, uh, to, to the recognition that nothing can be done without the uh, ongoing input of people for whom uh, the uh, care is uh, designed. Contact-based education is highly effective in reducing stigma. Uh, and contact-based education is basically uh, suggesting that people with lived experience should uh, be part of the delivery of programs. It can be alive or it can be like, you know, video clips like we have used uh, here. Um, AMI Quebec has been uh, going out to the community, to uh, uh, high schools, to universities and so on and so, for, so forth to talk about mental illness, mental health, stigma and so on. And as a, um, a, one of the components, and probably the most important and most uh, powerful component of these presentations is including someone with mental health uh, uh, experience, either someone who lived with uh, mental illness or a caregiver who lived with the experience of being uh, a caregiver. And this is usually what the audience retains. I think that this is really what makes the biggest impact and uh, may change uh, attitudes and uh, behaviors. Um, we, must, we must go beyond changing attitudes and seek to change behavior. Behavioral changes should be measured. And as again, I repeat myself a number of times, uh, negative attitudes uh, are important to change, but that much more important is really changing the uh, discriminatory uh, behaviors. Program tailored to to specific audiences. It's important to recognize that uh, you can't really have just one formula that will uh, 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 fit all. Uh, the context is important, the culture, the mentality is important, and it's important to tailor the intervention to each specific, um, uh, to each specific audience. Prejudice and discrimination are prevalent within the health system and must be recognized. Again, this is one of the key messages of the commission after all the research that they have done. Programs are needed to address this from better mental health education at post-secondary institutions to contact-based initiatives uh, in the field. And obviously there is a need for greater research into how stigma affect help seeking. Um, I mentioned earlier that youth has been identified as a very important um, uh, target for anti-stigma campaign. Uh, first of all, because uh, mental health issues, as we said earlier, start very often in uh, this age group. Uh, and also dispelling stigma uh, is expected to encourage help-seeking uh, behavior and foster hope and confidence in recovery among youth. Uh, but in addition to that, it is important also to work with the media and engage creative art as a means to uh, combat stigma. And uh, last but not least is uh, the importance of adopting human rights and social justice framework. This is really not just um, uh, suggesting that you know, it will be nice to have uh, mental illness at par with physical health and you know, provide proper care. This is really a human rights issue. And you know, from all this research that uh, I have uh, I, you know, uh, demonstrated, I think that it's really very clear that uh, the human rights of people with mental illness and mental health uh, issues are often uh, not respected uh, properly. So just to give you a couple of examples of uh, programs that uh, have been uh, uh, provided to healthcare prof professionals, and I think that what's important is maybe to see what uh, a participant in the program said. Uh, the program made such an impact, hearing someone's personal experiences with mental health and what helped, what didn't, and be reminded how successful someone can be when provided with supports. 
it certainly made me think of how we treat people differently, the myth and facts, stats were a real eye-opener. So, you know, this specific program um, was included, again, personal testimony, video clips, and educational components. Uh, and they run for either two and a half hours or one hour uh, with uh, the possibility of having booster sessions. Uh, it was tested in uh, different settings with various healthcare audiences. Um, and uh, consistently, the results were positive. And you can see that the pre and post um, uh, evaluation suggests that there was a significant increase of the uh, less stigmatizing uh, attitudes uh, after the program. Another example is a, um, a continuing medication education for physicians, and physicians are usually um, uh, considered very difficult to reach out to. So this, again, someone who participated in this program suggested that it gave me a better understanding of mental health and what people go through. I love the initial video, really makes you understand. Uh, it was easy to learn various teaching aids that kept my interest relevant to practice in a practical approach. It gave me more confidence with this type of patients. So again, uh, this uh, program was accredited program uh, that provided uh, uh, credits to uh, physicians. It included here again, personal testimony and video clips, educational components and skill training, and was uh, considered one of the best performing programs that was evaluated by uh, the Opening Minds program with the commission uh, to date. Um, there is a similar program for nurses now launched. I think that this was probably a while ago, so in all likelihood it has uh, been implemented already. And again, you can see here that there is a decrease, almost, almost double, uh, in the uh, reduction of uh, stigmatizing uh, attitude after the program was taken. I think that it's important also to uh, mention that um, it's not enough to have just you know one shot uh, uh, training. It's really important to you know to uh, recognize that there should be some continuity. Um, so you know, having said that, I think that what is important to uh, recognize that uh, reduction stigma is synonymous with improved or should be synonymous with improved quality of care. And some of the lessons that were learned through this research is that short one-off programs don't change culture. Uh, what is needed is sustained, coordinated, integrated approach. Because what we are talking about is really changing culture here. It's not just you know, uh, having knowledge about a specific subject, but it's really changing uh, a culture altogether. Embed anti-stigma messaging wherever possible. So again, I think that it's very important to do that when we target uh, uh, stigma and discrimination, but this is something that can be embedded in many other programs uh, throughout the healthcare system. Uh, boosters are needed. As I said, programming uh, should be ongoing. And programs work best when leadership support is strong, and I think that this is pretty evident. I think that it's quite clear that if uh, there is no interest and no blessing from leadership and management, the likelihood that uh, the uptake is going to be significant is uh, uh, less, uh, it's less likely that it will happen. It's really very important that leadership uh, would believe uh, in, this, um, in the importance of this program. Multiple social contact and emphasis on recovery are particularly important ingredients and target key learning uh, needs. So, uh, you know, I think that this is basically, you know, uh, what we are trying to suggest that mental health systems to date, in many cases, are either tolerating or producing unfairness, injustice, in, in, and inequities. And the uh, intention of, I believe, this presentation and our work on humanizing the healthcare system and uh, uh, making the experience of people with mental health and mental illness uh, that much more positive is really a goal uh, that we all have to uh, embrace. So I would like to uh, end with another brief clip. One nurse said to me, she said, and I'll always remember it, it was I was at my lowest, 
I was homeless and I was in the hospital. And she said to me, she says, it doesn't matter how many times you fall down as long as you can keep getting up. And I've always remembered that from that day. There was a nurse in a, in a side room one day who took me in the side room and, and looked me in the eye and said to me, you know, John, it's not your fault. And then my walls came down. She saw me as a person. So, you know, I think uh, what I'm suggesting that uh, reducing stigma and paying attention to the importance of uh, reducing stigma and, and discrimination is not a rocket science. It's a human science. It's a humane science. Thank you. As a physician working in this hospital and knowing the life of physicians in our emergency room in the wards, um, there's another aspect to it, and you, you indicated structure fosters or amplifies stigma. Um, physician burnout and stress is at a high level, and I could have to say from my own experience and seeing it around me, that when a patient comes in with complex medical problems complicated by mental illness, fragmented information, the physician takes a deep breath and they know that this patient's going to take four times more time than the previous one. And it's natural to develop resentment because they're the stress level of that patient. And so I don't think that without structural changes, without ways of inter interfacing patients, uh, mentally ill patients with some kind of aid to so that the physician can concentrate on the parts where their medical uh, expertise is called for and being able to put that case together and work efficiently with that patient it, with that not happening I think stigma just will, will burn on and continue because there's a resentment uh, it's uh, it's irrational it's but it's emotionally potent and I think that we need to have s administrative support structures interfacing some kind of situation even specialized clinics for disabled people where you have that additional information provided then the physician won't won't be so stigmat won't feel so negative won't be so stressed and won't burn out when they're faced with these patients i can't uh, agree uh more with you. I, I think that you're absolutely right. And I think that maybe the same kind of presentation we have to make to decision makers and to those who are, you know, holding the, the, the uh, uh, funding, uh, you know, I do agree with you. However, I think that it's, uh, you know, if we just expect the changes to come for up there, nothing is going to happen. And you know, I think that what you're suggesting suggests to me that there are other people who are stigmatized also for physical, you know, for complex physical uh, health issues. Uh, and so, you know, basically I, I would agree that what we are seeing is, is inadequate care period. Uh, I think that when it comes to mental illness and mental health, it's probably even more serious. But I do agree with you. Um, however, you know, I, I feel that we have our responsibility to do whatever we can within our limitations. Ella, thank you so much. Um, it applies to so much of what we do here every day, regardless of mental illness. I work in diabetes uh, education, and it's the same thing. A patient will sit down, and when you say it's not your fault, it's like, and the same thing with mental illness. It's a combination. We have a lot of patients from psychiatry. It's not their fault. And you listen, which nobody has five minutes to do, and then you have them come back, follow up, and then you get yelled at because statistics aren't there. But you have to listen to the patient, their plan, and make them, I understand, 100%, it's so important. Thank you. Yeah, so you know, again, I think that you know, again, uh, um, agreeing with what you said, just say it's not your fault, I'm here, I'm listening to you, goes a long way. It's really amazing how simple gestures have, could have such a strong impact. I believe that, that they are also time savers. Uh, listening for, for a few minutes will actually save time for the physician in the long run. I believe so, uh, but I think that you know sometimes uh, a short-term investment really ends up with uh, long-term saving. But very often what we do is really trying to put up fires to do something what we need right now and we don't really think about you know the consequences in the future. I agree. Okay, so I want to thank uh, Dr. Amir for a, a great talk on a very, very significant topic. Um, speaking as a physician, uh, it is um, such an important issue. It's a real, real challenge when you have individuals present <coughs> and 
<clears throat> it's, it's clear to you what, what the issues are, but I just want to remember my colleagues, my physicians, that uh, you call it humane, I call it empathy. And uh, if you don't have empathy, uh, this is gonna be a struggle for you. So remember, when you see these individuals, they need empathy, and it's uh, the least we could do to accommodate them. So thank you very much.